the law is uh, colliding with faith in new ways. Something's changed and therefore some, this study comes at the right time. Now to, to walk our way through what Christianity has done for the law through, through, through Christian history and, and open up what some of those principles are and to look at what, where we might go in the future, um, I hope it'll overwhelm you because the story is fantastic. But there have been a number of abolitions of slavery over, over time, and I'm just going to walk us through like a timeline of those, and then each time maybe take a little aside uh, uh, from, from each one. So the f abolition one, the early church is a opposition to slavery. Why was this significant? Well, about in the time of the first church, in the time of Jesus, somewhere between 50 and 75% of the population were slaves. It's huge, isn't it? It was the normal form of employment. It was the great economic institution. The Arist Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, thought that um, slavery was natural. It was expedient and it was just. He argued, quote, a slave is a living tool. Therefore, there can be no friendship with a slave as a slave. And some, as you know, some slaves did menial work, some were highly skilled, some were treated very badly and some were treated okay. It had that ambiguity about it the whole time. But an explosion went off in an obscure part of the New Testament. In the book of Philemon, Paul writes to the slave owner Philemon, Phil, he says, don't ask Onesimus, your former slave who ran away, don't punish him, but welcome him home. Are you ready? Welcome him home as a brother. There it is. Did you hear the explosion go off? No longer owner, slave, but brothers. Owners and slaves are having holy communion together. It could never be the same again. What's the problem with slavery? Well, it skews the world. Let's just say I'm a Roman and I want to get something done. So I go to, would I go to Ephesus and hire a free man who will have to pay more? Or should I go to Athens, buy a slave and get it done cheap? Is this sounding sort of contemporary? Well, if you get, if you get the slaves to do it, your productivity goes up, the prices go down. Is this sounding like what we hear? The living wage goes down and more families head into poverty. That is the normal equation of slavery. You might be enslaved and we might as well be. Understand? That's what slavery does. So when you hear someone talk about productivity in the press, that's what they're talking about. Two years after Emperor Constantine was converted, he passed the law outlawing that people should buy children to put going to slavery. In fact, you got punished, you got, you got hanged for it. And so on, it went all through the centuries. By the 12th century, slaves in Europe were rare, and by the 14th century, unheard of. In, in the West, that is. Incredible, wasn't it? Because of this courageous conviction of, of some Christians gradually working their way, exercising underground subversive influence, or when they got some power, passing the right laws. And that then the law created morality, the morality created virtue, and then it became the common sense. So by the, by the, by the uh, Renaissance, people are going, why would you want a slave? Bit of a shock, isn't it? From that little explosive, somewhat ambiguous verse. Everywhere else it talks about slavery, it's ambiguous. It's, you know, it's not for or against or anything. But there's something about the love of God working its way through private and public life that completely transformed the economic situation of the empires for a thousand, more than a thousand years. But there were other things that Christians did like this. I just want to divert slightly. And one of them is the sanctity of the child. Can you see those bones up there? That's a child's bones. It's terrible. It comes from a grave of 97 infants stuffed into a hole in a Roman villa. The Romans and the Greeks killed small children, infanticide it's called, or child abandonment if they're slightly older, routinely. In one survey in Delphi, there's an, there's an inscription of the, of the families there, 600 families. Only one family has two daughters. 
that's a very big skewing of a population. Because infanticide wasn't just for you know, the sick and the disabled and the failure to thrive. If they had it, one daughter already, they like, killed any others. Sorry, girls. The Christians objected to this, partly because of our conviction about the equality of men and women, but also because the scripture says, you shall not murder. So they took these babies and rescued them and took them into their homes and adopted them. And then when they became a public organization, they started orphanages. Friends, this is our heritage. And so with marriage equality, these days you wouldn't think Christians contributed a lot to marriage equality. But it was from the Christians that, that, that um, it, was, it, was, it was Gregory, Pope Gregory, who decided that marriage needed regulation. So he codified marriage laws, and, in, and his way of doing it as the Pope was to call marriage a sacrament. And because marriage was a sacrament, both the man and the woman had to give their consent before the marriage should take place. That's why in the marriage service today, do you give or do you take? Do you take? They each must say, because of the Christian view of marriage. And it's become widespread law now because of that moral influence. There are many others. Uh, human life. You can see the gladiators fighting in that picture. The Christians boycotted the gladiatorial games and got famous for it. You never come to our game, said Minucius Felix. You know, you're not very good citizens. You're party poopers. Because the Romans did not think twice about seeing the blood flow in the, in the games. It's like playing computer games, for real. They didn't think twice about those atrocities. But the Christians did. You shall not murder. People who, who today see mass murders as immoral don't realise that their beliefs in this are the result of having internalised the Christian ethic that holds human life to be sacred. So says uh, sociologist um, Alvin Schmidt. Let's go to step two on the abolition of slavery. How did this work? So when the Spanish went to the New World, to South America, <coughs> they were famous for their cruelty. And they, being Catholics from Spain, took priests with them, but those priests did not sit quietly. Antonio de Montesinos became famous and infamous. He was a Dominican friar, and in church he would preach against, quote, the cruelty and tyranny of the people who were sitting in the pews the military and merchants in front of him, openly rebuking them for their enslavement and their treatment of the American natives. Well, there's a reason why you've never heard of him. Because he was expelled. Governor of the colony just sent him away. The same thing happened here. There's a book called One Blood by John Harris that recounts many of these stories. But the book I'm showing you up here, um, one called The Blackfellow's Friend, is taken from the tombstone of one John Gribble, who was in Western Australia in the 1850s. And he also did what Tony de Montesinos did. He told people what they were doing to Aboriginal people, and in God's name, it was wrong. He was expelled. Happened time and time again. Well, when Tony de Montesinos got expelled, he was sent back to Spain where he could go around lobbying and telling people what was going on down there. And eventually, King Ferdinand passed laws against the enslavement of the American Indians. It's an incredible story, abolition too. The Spanish Catholics. Okay, abolition three. Still coming down towards this point of history. You slay the dragon, it comes back next year. Remember I said the 14th century slavery had come to an end? Well, it got revived. So the second abolition lasted about 30 years. That was it. The Portuguese and the Spanish got slaves from Africa and in, in larger numbers than in the North Atlantic, shipped them to their new colonies in South America. To compete with Spain and France, Britain decided to get slaves back as well. Partly also because Britain saw itself as emulating the great Greek and Roman empires. It's very much in the literature of that time. So the Greeks and the Romans had slaves. Can't be anything wrong with it. And off they went. We now know the inhumanity of those transports. And friends, they did then too. 
what's the worst about this is that this revival of slavery was undertaken by countries that call themselves Christian and supported by churches in all those countries, all the established churches. And this deserves a study in itself. That is so shameful. But there were some others. And William Wilberforce and his Clapham sect, as it was called, were those evangelical Christians of that century who worked tirelessly for decades trying to get the North Atlantic slave trade closed down. And just a few days before he died, in 1833, he received word that the Parliament had passed the Abolition Act and Wilberforce said, thank God that I should have lived to witness a day <laughs> in which England is willing to give 20 million sterling for the abolition of slavery, unquote. It freed 700,000 slaves. Incredible work. But the American bishops sided with the, the, the money makers in the US and approved of the continuity of slavery. Can you see those red lines on the top picture? That's all up in the northeast of the United States. All those little lines are what's called the Underground Railway. It was started in 1780. Started in secrecy by Levi and Catherine, both Quaker Christians. Their house is now a national monument. They personally helped 3,000 slaves to escape. And people were really devious and sometimes violent about how they got rid of, got a slave onto some transport or other. A lot of people were killed for doing this because it was against the law. The law supported the owners, but lots of people. They estimate that on the Underground Railway, 100,000 slaves escaped before the Civil War broke out. Martin Luther King used to say, or said this about the church, it is appalling that the most segregated hour of Christian America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. In other words, the church has led the way in having separateness from each other. And that's not our heritage. Jesus said, no Jew nor Greek, no slave nor free. Our heritage from Jesus is one in Christ. But our practice has been something else. You know, this congregation is unusual. And I thank you. It's not easy, is it? That's good. That's good. This is only one, one of the issues for the church today. There are four great cover-ups. One you'll hear a lot of is, uh, you know, the, the abuse that's in, um, in the press about sexual abuse of children in institutions. That, you know, that completely ignores adoption, fostering, homelessness. There's an awful lot more than we're hearing about. And the church, the, the biggest problem is not that it happened. You know, there's a rotten, rotten, rotten apple somewhere. But it was covered up. That is the greatest shame of the church in that department. The second one, okay, we did some good things with marriage. But then anyone who disagreed with us, we started to think we own marriage. We start punishing people for anything that they did, did different. Even if it was ethically described. You know, like they had some ethics about it, they just did it differently. Okay, in, in Africa, if they were polygamous, which was been the custom for who knows when, they were told they had to divorce all the other wives, which kind of made them destitute. And some other. And that, was a, that was an order from head office. It wasn't what actually the missionaries on the ground wanted, by the way. The missionaries on the ground said, look, we'll just say, look, the Christian teachings, one man, one wife, four life, and, and, and you've got wives now, you must do a good job of looking after those families uh, for this generation. And then in future, I don't know. That's what, they, that's what the locals said. They got overruled by head office where all the money is. It's just becoming a thing. Punitive marriage doctrines. The third is this complicit in colonialism, which I've talked about uh, all around the world. The Crusades were one of those, and they're most often referred to. And the Pope has actually apologized officially for that. For the act of conquest and, uh, as an act of enlightenment was justified by saying, we are superior. And they even pressed shonky science into the cause to try and say that. Social Darwinism. As I said before, it's, it is Australia's, well, I, this is not my phrase, it's invented by the late great Sir Veronica, Sister Veronica Brady. Australia's original sin. Treatment of Aboriginal people, and it's not over. This is the last one. The way in which, very common now, Christians get legalistic about what's right and what's wrong and tell everybody. 
It doesn't sound anything like the Gospels. It doesn't sound anything like what Jesus did. Yes, yes, I mean, ethical rules are very useful. But to go around telling people where they're right and where they're wrong and who's in and who's out, that's got nothing to do with the Gospels. How can you, how can you pass judgment without reference to the judge? That's what happens. Christianity is a mixed bag, isn't it? But I tell you, if you, you ought to be overwhelmed by the positive track record. Yes, there are, there are acts of corruption along the way, and some of them are still with us. But be overwhelmed that the grace of God working in Christian people who courageously took the next step without knowing where it led has changed the world's morality. It is now under threat, but there it is. But the dragon is back up again. The fourth abolition was not enough. There's a fifth one underway now. There are now, now more slaves in the world than there ever have been in history. 30 million is one estimate. And things like Not For Sale campaign led by David Batston or, or, or the Stop The Traffic um, campaigns are trying to do something about that. And now it's a slightly different, it's a bit, bit subtler. Uh, it has been around before, but this is the majority one. We know about sex trafficking, but that's not the majority. The majority of slaves today are that I say, look, uh, you're doing it a bit hard. Why don't, if you come with me to um, another country, I'll pay you away and I'll give you a wage and I'll look after you. And you can earn some money and send it back and get out of debt, okay? And the person says, oh, that's all right. So they go over there and they give them a wage and they set them in the room. Oh, the rent is. You didn't tell me there was rent. Hang on, the rent is pretty well all my wage. I'm never going to make anything. Yeah, what well, you signed. And the lawmaker, the law keepers, the, the police, are on the side of the lawmakers who say, you signed the contract, you have to stay. And so you, you, you live forever in that bondage. That's the most common form of slavery today, and it's all legal. There are some ways that uh, um, we can contribute to law. Um, this reabolition of slavery would be one. Um, we're growing prisons instead of communities, instead of helping people. Refugee rights, love makes a way. Welcome to Australia. All these are currently Christians are doing these. Tackling issues of religious freedom. Supporting holistic sentencing. You know, a mandatory sentencing just fills prisons and changes nothing. Now, all the research says that. Anyway, we politicians do it anyway. Peacemaking, you know, the resources of, of religion for making peace is uh, contrary to what some people think. You know, religion causes all the wars. But it was by taking a Christian approach to Northern Ireland that Tony Blair was able to come to the Good Friday Peace Accord, which has stuck. And once the peacemaking influence is still alive, we can be good for the law. We've done it by codifying, by ethical strength, by including others with emergency responses, subverting the law, new advances, because we believe in the impartial judge of all humankind, because we believe in the fallenness of all humans, and because we believe in the specific contours of Jesus' justice and Jesus' grace, despite our own corruption and our own confusion and our own hypocrisy in all kinds of areas, we have exercised the positive influence for the common good and against sectional, sectional self-interest and the church's own self-interest. Friends, in principle, in practice, and incredible people have made a huge creative contribution from the church to the law. Now people think humanism is normal, but it's not. It's Jesus who made, who invented it. I can't see it. It's good to tell these stories. It's good to keep it going. Let me finish with this uh, prayer. If you would like to, you know, just say to people, look, uh, by all means, change uh, what's been established, but just know what you're changing, choose very carefully, and learn to tell these stories wherever you are, as best you can. Whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, you are a gift of God to the world. May you be a nuisance, a fool and a godsend. May beauty, truth and goodness flow out from your faith, hope and love. May the God of all wisdom guide your path, shine hope into your struggle, and heal your love. Do not fear. It is enough to say yes and take one step. Amen. Thank you.